Before I start the video, I want to give a thanks to my new patrons, Scrub Adubby, Lord Mantis, The Moose of Hornwood, and Bjorn Gilsbro. Patreon is a membership site that makes it easier for independent creators to get paid. And for just $1, you get access to bonus content for my channel that you won't find anywhere else. And you also make it a little bit easier for me to create these videos full time. So click the link in the description to learn more. Era Vulgaris is the fifth studio album by the American rock band Queens of the Stone Age. Released on June 12, 2007, it went on to be the last album that the band released in the 2000s, marking the end of an era and a transition into a whole new musical territory. There's a lot of old school Queens fans that loved the first three records, but now there was this new generation coming in that started liking their new stuff. Opinions and musical taste aside, in this video we'll take Take a look at Era Vulgaris' history and the top 10 most interesting facts about the album. So starting off at number 10, Driving and Presence. While their magnum opus and third album, Songs for the Deaf, was inspired by a drive throughout the desert landscapes of California, Era was inspired by a drive that Josh Homme, the band leader, had done through Hollywood. In an interview that him and guitarist Troy Van Leeuwen did right after the album came out, he said, quote, it ended up drawing inspiration from things that were right around. At first, it wasn't much to say, it was more about music, and then it became about noticing the right now, end quote. There's an old TV show from the 2000s called The Hour, and he was doing an interview here as well where he said something similar. Quote, the idea is to traverse the time frame and make quality music that really is of this time frame, always of the present, end quote. Apparently driving is something that can get people into a more present state, or at least that's the case for Josh Homme. Number 9, Chris as a producer. This was the first time ever since 2000's Rated R, the band's second record, that Chris Goss and Josh Homme produced the album together. And I believe that on both of those records, they don't put their names in the credits as producers, they just go under the moniker 515ers. In an interview with Billboard on February 6th of 2007, Goss mentioned how they had planned to create a duo, like a side project, for a very long time. And they actually ended up doing a performance that same year. Quote, there will be one show and more to follow. We're focusing on the show, but we have talked about doing a record." End quote. Sadly, 515ers ended up becoming a one-off show and more of a production duo rather than a side project. Number 8. Jesse F. Keeler and Billy Gibbons In an interview on the Australian radio show Triple J back in June 2006, Jesse Keeler, the bassist of Death From Above 1979, mentioned how he would appear as a bassist on the new Queen's album, Era Vulgaris. He then mentioned how he couldn't tour with the band because he wanted to spend more time with his girlfriend. And sadly, at the end of the day, he didn't appear on the album and didn't collab with Queens at all because of conflicting schedules. Apparently, the CZ Top vocalist and guitarist Billy Gibbons was also going to appear on this record, just like he did on the previous Queens record, Lullabies to Paralyze. But sadly, he couldn't do it either, again, also because of um, conflicting schedules. Number 7. Confirmed guest artists. If you're a big Queens fan from before, you're not a stranger to the fact that this band is always inviting guests onto their new records. And on this record, you have some new faces and some old faces. You have Julian Casablancas, Elaine Johannes, Mark Lanigan, Chris Goss, Serena Sims, Brody Dale, and Liam Lynch. Trent Reznor was also a contributor here. Although he didn't appear on all the versions of this album, he did appear on the UK version as well as a promo disc. He did vocals for the title track, Aero Vulgaris, and I really don't have any idea why they didn't include that song on all the versions of this album because it's it's just an amazing song. Number 6. Fertita and Schumann if you look at the back of this album, at the album credits, the only official members of the band at this point was Josh Homme, Troy Van Leeuwen, and Joey Castillo. Naturally, when they were going to tour and play this album, they needed a bigger crew, and that's when they hired Dean Fertitta as 
a keyboardist and multi-instrumentalist, and Michael Schumann as their bassist. And these two became the official members and a part of the lineup that you'll see of the band today. Number five, the promotional contests. Before the album's release, there was a contest put out as a post on the band's fan-made forum, thefade.net. I tried to do some research, but I didn't find out what you had to do in order to get into the contest, in order to win, but apparently the band ended up sending out some packages on April 13th, and this package was a CD with a singular song on it, and that was the title track, Era Vulgaris. And along with the CD, the fans also got this handwritten note that encouraged fans to share this song online wherever they wanted. To put this into context, during the early 2000s, a lot of artists struggled to make money because of the rise of digital file sharing. A lot of people could just grab files online and share it or steal it. You could access all the music in the world almost just with a click of a button and artists didn't know how to deal with this economically. So <laughs> I guess this was a way for the band to promote digital file sharing and at the same time hopefully not losing as many CD buyers? I don't know. Maybe it would have made more sense for them to do this if they planned to sell the album online, but I can't really find any article online saying that this album was available to, for purchase online, so I, I don't know. Number four, the artwork. The artwork for Era Vulgaris was a breath of fresh air for the band and the fans, I would guess. A lot of the artwork that they had released with albums in the past had a tendency to be very plain and simplistic. And then I'm talking, of course, about Lullabies to Paralyze, Songs for Deaf, Rated R. The debut album gets a pass. The cover features these two cartoon characters, two light bulbs. The yellow one is apparently called Bulby, and the green one is called Stumpy. I don't know how they ended up getting names. The style of the characters and the overall concept of the album cover was a satire on 50s TV commercials. Now, as you can probably tell, I personally didn't grow up in the 50s and I'm not from the US, but apparently in the 50s in the US, you could watch cartoon characters like Fred Flintstone, for example, smoking a pack of cigarettes. And that was a commercial. That was a legit thing. Stuff like that would never be allowed today, and, and that's so much fun to think about. Number three, multiple characters. Bulby and Stumpy weren't the only characters that were designed for Era Vulgaris. If you do a quick Google search for Era Vulgaris characters, you'll find a whole collection of different weird creatures. The artwork was made by this company called Morning Breath that is composed of two artists. Doug Cunningham and Jason Noto. These guys apparently used to design the artwork for skateboards down in San Francisco. And uh, when they did this collaboration with Queens of the Stone Age, it probably helped them quite a bit in terms of getting their art out to more people. Number two, Make It With You. That rhymes. Make It With You is the seventh track off of Era Vulgaris. It's also the third single that they released with this album. But with that being said, it wasn't really a new song at the time. An older version of the song was released back in 2003 with the band leader Josh Homme's side project, The Desert Sessions. The earlier 2003 version has a bit more of a softer production. The guitar part, I don't know whoever's playing the guitar in this song, if it's Josh Homme, the guitar riff is a little bit different. Uh, the person is adding another hammer-on somewhere in there. This older version feels more bluesy and swanky. Another very, very important difference is that Mark Lanigan is doing the lead vocals here. On the Era Vulgaris 2007 version, Josh Homme is doing the vocals, so immediately the song turns into something a lot more different. The production is a lot more metallic and poppy. Personally, I'm a much bigger fan of the earlier version, the Desert Sessions version. I'll leave links to both of the versions in the description if you want to check them out, and uh, I would really appreciate it if you let me know in, in the comments which one you like the best. And number one. YouTube. The first video that Queens of the Stone Age ever published to their official account on YouTube was a video called Queens of the Stone Age Creating Era Vulgaris 2. This was 12 years ago on March 8, 2007, just two years 
after YouTube became a thing, which is crazy. The, the guys in charge of marketing of Queens of the Stone Age related stuff was really following the trends at the time, apparently. YouTube really wasn't even a trend at the time. It was such a small website still. That's probably the nerdiest fact on this list. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Now, if you enjoy my video essays on rock music, consider checking out my Patreon page. Patreon is a membership site that makes it easier for creators like me to get paid. For just $1, you get access to tons of behind the scenes material that you won't find anywhere else. Recently, I did a poll here on the channel where I asked you what you thought was a cool membership reward. And tons of people voted for listening parties. So for just $3, you get access to both bonus content and a monthly listening party on Discord where we collaborate on the playlist. Click the link in the description to learn more. And by the way, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching again. Cheers.